Let me go into introducing Detlef. Detlef is a, a long-term friend, colleague, collaborator. We've met many, many years ago, and I don't want to embarrass him or myself telling how many. Um, it, it, I think it happened when I was a young group leader in Göttingen, and there was someone who knew all my papers. He didn't just know the titles, he knew the content down to the methods, and I was, wow. Um, I don't know if I ever told you, but he came and we discussed things that I had written many years ago. He remembered probably better than I did, and, and that was really impressive, and I was even more impressed when he decided to do his PhD on entirely theoretical biology, using all the literature out in the world. So he's, he's an early version of AI, I could say, uh, because what he did is he was scanning the vast literature and he was extracting patterns from there and combined that and came to conclusions that he eventually, when he started as a postdoc or later in his own leg, that he eventually experimentally validated. I think this is the science that I was really thrilled of and he, he also started a new, not a new model system, but he started a model system that was not that popular at the time. I remember there were many fights and there were many ideas that the next model system must not be Platinaries, but Detlef did Platinaries, and I think we're all very happy that he did Platinaries because otherwise we wouldn't have his postdocs at the time now professors as colleagues here at COS. So he, he started really a, a very impressive lineage and has done many, many things. One of the things he's well known for, famous for, these days is that he is, has started a new program at EMBL that is planetary biology. And I think in the discussion that we had beforehand, it became pretty apparent that he's bringing together his initial motivation to go for biology, which is more on the conservative and, uh, yeah, biology side, and then molecular biology all the way, and now closing the loop and getting that into a global perspective. I think this is probably best illustrating that this here is not just the inner thing, but this could be a representation of the entire world that we all have to make an effort to maintain in a state that we can all live in it. And to do research on that with that perspective is something you will hear more about maybe in the discussion, uh, but it, it's all centered around the brain. And this is where he will start today, the origin of the nervous system, decision-making in early animals. And they make decisions, and I make the decision to hand over to Detlev, and thank you very much for being here. Thanks, thanks, Jochen, for this very kind and nice introduction. It's, it's my pleasure to be here at, at COS today with, with my colleagues, and, and I'm especially pleased, actually, with my audience. I love it that it is a lot of high, high school students. Some of you uh, will be exposed to, to this kind of science maybe for the first time. It's the most interesting period in your life because your brain is currently filled with suggestions of what, what interesting things one can do, also then later in your professional career. And so what I would like to convey, the message I would like to con convey today that is also what is it to be a scientist? And that is um, actually, and we discussed this before in our nice discussion, Jochen, it is actually to, to pursue the interest in a very similar way as you actually did as a kid. As a kid, you are curious, you are interested in something, you want to find out about something. It's something that is fascinating and you just do it. You, you go into it, you, you learn about it, and at the end you solve the riddle. And this... As a scientist, you just continue to do so. So you, you have the chance, actually, of living a life where you can follow your curiosity, where you can find out about things that you find really interesting. This can be very different things. And um, for me, that's where the story starts. It has been to, in a way, find out about ourselves. It is, um, and, and in ourselves, by ourselves, I mean the, the, our, the organ that is most about us which is actually our brain, our central nervous system. Yeah, this is where somehow, which the organ we are thinking with, and I'll start with this, it's also where our soul lies somehow, where our 
unique individuality lies and this organ, our brain, our nervous system, has arisen in evolution. This has been a long process. Yeah? There were once animals without a brain and then evolution has, has shaped the nervous system, has, has shaped us. And you might, you might be um, surprised to hear that we don't know that much about this process. But this was, in fact, the question I was, when I became a scientist as a student, that I, I um, encountered and that I just found fascinating. And even more fascinating, finding out that there was nothing known or near, nearly nothing known about this. And so um, my topic of today is the origin of the nervous system. And by this, I mean the evolutionary origin. And um, I will tell you what we, how we approach this and, and um, what we know about this. So I, will, I have here a little structure for my presentation. I will start by explaining what a brain is and what it is not. And if you want to, that if you want to really understand our brain, what we have in our head, what you are using all the time, we have to use evolution. We have to look into evolution, how it evolved. Um, and then I will tell about the research we are doing, which is about sponges and also about the marine worms. That's this analyte that, that Jochen just alluded to. And, and then give a little bit of a synthesis what we currently think how our brains evolved, how they came about, how they started simple and finally evolved into our brain. Yeah? And um, as a start, um, I would like to stress that brains are in a way organized like a computer. That's not new to you, I guess. So we have electrical units in our brain called neurons. And these, um, to, to a large extent, our brain is in fact organized like a computer. You could say we have something in our head that, that are electrical units are working like little tr transistors. And um, so neurons are electrical units. They either fire or not fire. Yeah, a unit can be active or not active. And um, to do so, they integrate information from other neurons, yeah? like as you have it in, a, in an electrical circuit. And um, then they have these long axons yeah, that um, conduct the firing to other neurons that then again integrate the information and then fire or not fire. Yeah? They transmit the signal. And the important point is that they have this transmission point from one neuron to the next. So whenever, um, for example, Sorry, one urine contacts the other, this is here, then um, there is a, a, a tr transduction from the electrical signal from one urine to the other, and this happens through synapses. So these are just the contact points between different neurons. Yeah? In an electrical circuit, this would all be electrical. In the nervous system, it's a little bit more complicated in that we have these synapses in our our brain and in our nervous system. I think many of you will have heard about synapses. It's in a way very easy. So this is the ending of one neuron. It ends with this little button here. And this is the next neuron that is then receiving the information. It all goes via the, trans via the release of these little black dots here, which are a signal that is received by the other neurons. If there's il enough of a release from this um, signal here, from these bubbles, um, then there is a strong activation of the re receptors here on this side and an electrical current is again generated. And so there's an electrical signal arriving here, prompting the release of these vesicles here in into this synaptic cleft. And then the signal is received on the other side. An elect electrical signal is again produced. And then the, um, the, the next neuron is integrating this electrical signal. Um, the one, the um, first neuron is called presynapse, the other neuron is called postsynapse. This is a, a very confusing slide, but I have chosen it to show you that this here is, of course, a simplified scheme. Yeah, this is how you can draw it. This is closer to reality. This would be the presynapse where these vesicles uh, with the transmitter are located, and this is just an effort of a, of a researcher to to draw it in a way that is maybe closer to reality with all these molecules. Yeah, they all have their individual names, names don't matter here, um, that form this structure. Yeah, biology is very complicated, but all it does is in fact is to receive the electrical signal 
and to release these bubbles here with, with, the, with the signal that signals to the next neuron. But what is important is that um, there are hundreds of these proteins. They all have their specific um, amino acid sequence. I think as, as high school students you know that um, proteins are composed of, of amino acids. They all have a specific construction if you want. They, they are composed of amino acids and then um, and this sequence of amino acid of the proteins is encoded in our genome. Yeah? In every cell in our body we have our genome. The genome is like a library where the information for all these proteins that make our body, yeah, like, like these ones, all of these ones, is encoded and, and read. And um, the proteins are built according to this information here. Um, what is fascinating, and this has in, in a way always intrigued me, is that Many of these building blocks, many of these proteins, also the ones that are in the synapse, are evolutionarily conserved. That means we have them in our neurons, in our brain, but the same molecules or very similar molecules with very similar amino acid sequence, and this is, this is a very clear signal, are also found in a fly or are also found in a worm. And this is in a way like a signature, like a fingerprint that the specific amino acid sequence of these proteins that allows us to find them back in other animals. So we can then say um, this specific UNC13, for example, has a, has a specific sequence, has a specific molecular um, sequence of amino acids, and the same sequence is found in the worm or in the fly. And this way we can then say, yeah, they, the common, last common ancestor of us and of a fly had this little synaptic protein already, and it was using it probably in synapses. So we can learn that similar molecules, similar synapses already existed in the last common ancestor. And now you already get a feel for how we are constructing these ancient ancestors. We look into animals that live today, look into the um, specific construction of the nervous system with the protein content, the amino acid sequences, we compare them with the computer, and then we deduce what the last common answer is, what the building blocks in the last coming answer there was. Um, yeah. And what we know already is that many of the synaptic proteins, the ones I'm showing here, are very old. And we know that some of them even existed before the nervous system was actually in place, in animals that are even older than the nervous system is. And this is what I'm, I'm coming to in a minute. Um, the computer-like brain is mostly situated in what we call our cortex. This is this part of our brain. You might have seen images of our human brain before. This is a, a scheme showing you roughly how it also looks in your head. These are myriads of cells and they are all connected in the way I've shown you before. So they are talking to each other, they are integrating information, they operate in a way computer-like and um, it's, this organ is called, or this part of the brain is called cortex. But my, my next point is to convince you that even though brains are organized like a computer, what I've just shown you, our brains are more than a computer. They are kind of weird in that they have elements that you will not find in your, in your PC at home. Um, they are very special and what you find are parts of the brain, for example, like the hypothalamus. This is this part of the brain, the specific um, architecture here doesn't matter. But what I want to tell you is that this hypothalamus is not, is not, many of these neurons, they are also firing, but they do something else. They produce and release hormones and specific signals that influence us a lot. And this is making, in a way, a little bit what makes your personality. Um, and so they have specific signals that influence the entire brain and body, these, these cells that are located here. For example, there is oxytocin, the love hormone. If we smell something or see something or hear something pleasant, we want to cuddle. This hormone, for example, enhances sexual arousal. There is um, dopamine, the feel-good hormone, very important. It gives us a sense of pleasure, for example, too. There are stress hormones, of course, as well. But there is also um, this dopamine here controls our, us, our learning, as a reward center. 
Yeah? We are not equally interesting in everything. We are rewarded by our reward system in the brain, by, by neurons that, that are located in the stem of our brain, um, to keep going in this direction, yeah? to maybe learn more about this or to do more of this kind, because dopamine, the feel-good hormone, tells us so. And needless to say that many drugs increase the amount of dopamine, yeah? many drugs you've heard about, um, as this is something that pleases us. Yeah? And um, so this part of the brain is also different than the computer brain part that I just alluded to you be before, in that um, it has very, sometimes a very simple structure. There are cells, neurosecretory cells, that project into this um, part of, of the brain where they release these substances into the blood. And um, here you have something that looks very similar to the presynapse that I showed you before, but instead of talking to other neurons, it's talking to the entire brain, it's talking to the blood, and it, it brings the signal into the entire body. So you recall we, there is the computer part of our brain, but then there's also the part of our brain that brings more emotions in and releases dopamine or oxytocin, so substances that influence us, helps, help us make our decisions, and these are spread by cells that look much more like these cells that have a simple axon going into a release center where, where this is released and then reaches um, into the entire body, actually. And um, so this is, in a way, in, a, in simple terms, the setting of, of this, these two elements that we, we have in, in our head that is part of our brain, the computer-like part and also this hormone-influenced part, the, the emotional system. And um, my next section is to tell you that nothing in biology makes sense but in the light of evolution. So we want to know how did we come to this specific architecture, composition of the brain. And for this, um, this is a topic that is on our minds not too long. It, it, of course, started with Darwin, who brought evolutionary thinking into the world and convinced many people that, first of all, humans were not created, but they stem from something else and, and um, in a way, from, from great apes. But, of course, this, this story goes much further. So this is a... It was actually a caricature um, making fun of Darwin at, at, at these times, but, in fact, it, it depicts it very nicely that there's, there's a human, of course, and then there's, there has been a, a line of ancestry that goes back further and further. So our great, 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 and so on parents that once lived, yeah, were not humans. They, they, they look differently. If we go long enough, far enough in our ancestry, we come to animal-like beings. And um, what is conveyed with this caricature here is that man is but a worm. So that in the beginning, we, we stem from worms. Roughly, this is true. The question we are asking us, what brains were the, did these worms have? What was going on in these animals? And how did it evolve? For what purpose? Yeah? And how does it relate to, for example, the organs we have in our body today? Yeah? And so what we, this outlines our, our research approach. So we are interested as I said, in our brains. But to learn about its origin, we go back very far in evolution. So this is our line of ancestry. This represents animals that once lived, yeah, that are your, your great, 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 great parents and so on. And you will be aware that there was once a, a, a great, great parent in your line of ancestry that also gave rise to sharks. Yeah? This is long ago. It's, it's many hundreds of millions even. There was once an animal that gave rise to all vertebrates that live today. Yeah? That was the animal that, a very successful animal. I mean, vertebrates are everywhere. Yeah? It, is, it is us, it is snakes, it is sharks, it is also lamprey, this one here, which is a little weird. Um, these, these vertebrates arose with this ancestor. There was this animal that once lived. There was once an ancestor that gave rise also to um, animals that look a little bit like us, like fish, like vertebrates, but don't have a vertebral column yet. Uh, these are, this was, in a way, the first chordate. This is already a long time ago, 530 million years ago. Not much earlier, 
there was an animal that give, gives rise to all what we call bilateral animals. And these are animals that have bilateral symmetry, just like us. You know, you have a left and right side, if you ever noticed. And many animals have this. Yeah? They, flies are also bilateral animals. Yeah? Even, also simple worms have a left and right side. And um, this was an, an incredible um, successful ancestor, as, as most of what you see on land and on sea is actually bilateral. Yeah? So these animals are all over the place. And the annelid we are working with has been chosen, not because it, it represents this ancestor, but because it also stems from this bilateral ancestor. And it hasn't changed that much in evolution. All of these animals I'm depicting here are relatively ancient in that they didn't change much. But of course, they evolved for the same time, right? They also accumulated a lot of changes afterwards. And so on and so forth. And there, if, if we go further back in evolution, probably more than 600 million years, there was an animal that gave rise to one of our most remote cousins that live today, and these are sponges. You know what sponges are. Yeah, some of them have it in a bath tube. They are squishy and um, full of water. They don't really move. They are really strange animals. What is interesting about them is that they don't have a brain. And if you want to explore how a structure comes up, an organ comes up, the best strategy is to also look into something that doesn't have it yet. And yet is really true in this, in this regard, as sponges probably stem from an ancestor where there was no nervous system in place. And so I will speak about this ancestor a little. This is also where our title slide comes from. This is, in a way, a nice um, AI-generated um, mix of a brain and a sponge, because sponges often look like brains. And this is, this is uh, interesting because they don't have one. Yeah? So can sponges think? The answer is obviously no. Um, yeah? But the big question is, if they don't possess neurons, yeah? they are, they are um, filter pumps, they, they pump water. Yeah, I, will, I will give you a short explanation of what a sponge does. Sponges are beautiful animals. Yeah? They live mostly in, in, the, in the water, and um, these ones live in the Mediterranean. They are yellow, they are, look cool, kind of like a chimney here, because they, they are filter pumps that pump water and filter out the nutrients. And this is all they do. They have, this is what a sponge looks like under the electron microscope. This is a microscope that gives you all details that you want to see. Um, and here are, in this um, tent that is, is the outer surface of the sponge, there are little holes. You see them here, the water goes in. And then there are the, all these small chambers that are pumping the water. And this chimney here yeah, is then the outlet. This is where the water goes out. And in the meantime, the sponge then just filters everything from the water and with these little chambers. Yeah, and these chambers have individual cells. This is the first time I, I show you a cell today. You all know what cells are. Yeah? Cells are the units of life. And cell types, we are composed of different cell types. Yeah? Your body is full of muscle cells, neurons, it's, it's gut cells, yeah? you name it, skin cells. They are all cells. Yeah? And these cells in the sponge are cells that are, are able to pump water so that they produce flow. And at the same time, they are filter devices. So they have these little baskets here yeah, with which they filter water. That's all you need to know about sponges. What is really fascinating is what does a sponge like this that you find in a lake? Yeah, now is actually the time to collect them. One of my students was out um, collecting sponges just a few days ago. Um, what do these sponges do with the synaptic protein? But one, be, be, because what you, I told you they don't have a nervous system, but they do have a lot of synaptic proteins. For example, all of them that are depicted in blue here, in red, and in green, are present in the sponge genome. This we know because, meanwhile, we have sequenced a lot of animals. We have looked into the library of their, um, of their genetic information and found that all these sponge proteins that resemble synaptic proteins are present in the genome, even though they don't have synapses. So we were asking the question, and this is our research now, what are um, these proteins doing? And for this, we did something what you can do now. Just imagine we would take your body, dissolve it into the individual cells, then you have a, a, a big soup of cells, and then you pick the individual cells and sequence all of them, and 
And what you're looking for is the information, what part of the genetic information in your cells is actually read off, so transcribed. You know transcription and translation, and you also know that all cells get different because they transcribe and translate different part of the genome. Yeah? Your skin cell and your neuron just use different information from the big library. Yeah? And what is technically possible these days is that you can take an animal, you dissolve it into cells. Yeah, so this once was a sponge, but now it's a soup of sponge cells. And then you put them into a machine, you close a drawer and say, okay, um, work for me. And what the machine does and what you do afterwards, it, it, it tells you about hundreds of genes that were actively read in that cell. And this way you can, in a way, learn something about that cell because you learn all the amino acid sequences of the proteins that are in. And that what we were asking then is if when we did these experiments is which are the cells in the sponge that um, use the synaptic genes. Yeah? And but this way we wanted to find out, okay, what does a sponge do with the synaptic proteins if it doesn't have synapses? Yeah? But the sponges, were, they have them already. So looking what these sponge proteins, the synaptic proteins are doing would tell us something about nervous system evolution. And the answer is, is depicted in a very simple way here. I showed you already these chambers of cells that are pumping the water. And these, these chambers also have individual cells here that sit in the middle of the chamber, and they are the ones having the presynaptic proteins. So the, there, in these cells, we found the proteins that in us, you know, the, same, the same building blocks, make the presynapse. So it's these cells. So what, can we, what do we know about these cells? Well, um, it's this cell here. Now it's an even larger magnification. They contact the pumping cells and the filtering cells. So these are these ones, which have the postsynaptic proteins. And um, so they are in contact with these. And you see it already from just looking at this. They are, they are exchanging information, just like the neurons in your body do. So they are cells that are um, in contact with many other cells. Yeah, here and here and here, with little protrusions. They look a little bit like axons even. Yeah. And um, then we looked even closer and, and went into what is called the ultrastructure so the, of these cells, so what they look like at electron microscopic level. And what we saw then is that they have these little these vesicles, just as the pre-synapse, pre -synapse, you remember, here. Yeah, we, we, these vesicles are also found in these cells. So we think that these cells, even though they are not neurons, they already have components that later made it into the presynapse, into the nervous system. So they are already active in probably conveying, releasing signals that the other cells in the sponge body listen to. Yeah? And from this, and this is, this is then how it works, if you have an observation like this, you then continue with um, a model and our model then for the evolution of the first neuron was that there were cells that, that I've drawn here. These cells would be something like pre-neurons and they um, would be sensing the environment and at the same time release vesicles into the environment and um, so integrate information in a way like a, like a neuron does. So they receive signals here, they then integrate these signals, and then based on this, they release vesicles. So this is what we found in the sponge. Yeah? And um, what might have happened then, no, sorry, what might have happened then in evolution is that from these cells with the release of vesicles, neurons could have evolved, for example, by starting to talk to each other via axons. Yeah? So this, this would be a theory for um, the evolution of the first neurons from cells that were previously just releasing vesicles, releasing, releasing signals, and then um, evolving into, into the first neuron. Because now you see we might have something like the first synapse here, which was not there before. Yeah, and this illustrates how we do it. So we look into animals that have lived long ago. We find components in weird cells, but we see what these cells are doing. We see also what is shared with us. Yeah, and this way, then we come up with, a, with an hypothesis how these um, neurons communicate. This hypothesis is called um, chemical brain hypothesis, and, and Gaspar knows it well because he, he came up with it also. And um, 
this is the entry into maybe the first occurrence of the first neuron. And um, so sponges do not possess neurons, but then what happened with the first brains? And for this, we come to the next part. The first brains occurred in marine worms. Um, there was sponges, the last ancestor of the sponges I showed you before was maybe something like 600 million years ago. The um, latest ancestor that we shared with all these bilateral animals was from times when these animals here lived. So all these are already bilateral symmetrical. You see that. And they live, lived in the ocean um, something like four, 540 million years ago. This is called the Cambrian explosion because this ancestor was so successful that very soon there were all of all these aliens evolving and they probably had brains already. This we know because the today living ancestors from the bilaterian, they have they are sharing brain synapses and so on. We know that these components must have been present in these animals. So these are incredibly fascinating um, fossils. I mean, all of these are animals that have been um, have been drawn according to fossil records, so fossils that we found in, in the sediments, the deposits in, in, in the, of the former oceans. And um, these, yeah, this is about now about the bilateral ancestor. And as I told you, this gave rise to us, but also to annelid worms. So now we look into annelid worms. And this um, is the model, the animal model that we have in our laboratory. It also lives at COS here with, with Gaspar's new lab. And, and um, Platina Reyes is, lives in, in the sea, in tubes. It, it builds them the, itself. What we like about Platina Reyes, and this is what I told you before, is that it, is, it didn't change much over the millions and hundreds of millions of years in that um, you find fossils that are of almost the age that I just showed you, like this one here, that looked very similar, had similar sensory organs. So this was our criterion to find something that lives today and resembles these ancient animals. And these worms have structures in the brain. First of all, they are full of cells that I've showed you for our brain. You remember the hypothalamus releasing hormones. And these are cells that look very similar. They, they are simple cells that have then long axons that go into a certain release sites where hormones are released. And if you then look what these hormones are, so they have neurons that release hormones just like in our head. They have oxytocin, dopamine, yeah, the same hormones I talked about at the beginning that, that in a way make our emotional state and, and reward our reward center. So this is also present in these animals. So these are, and they, are, they form part of the mushroom bodies. These mushroom bodies, they are called mushroom bodies because they look like mushrooms. They are centers of learning and memory. So this is, in a way, like, like your cortex that you have in your head. These worms have mushroom bodies. Flies also have mushroom bodies. And um, they have these cells that um, contain densely packed neurons. Name doesn't matter here. And um, axons. And we have looked and there's obviously information exchange between these axons. And we have looked into these mushroom bodies and found that these neurons here express very similar molecules as our cortical neurons do. And this is exactly what I explained you in the beginning. Yeah, this is, in a way, our approach. We look into weird animals, like these marine worms. We find, we do single cell sequencing, so this is how we, how we do it these days. And we find that there are neurons in these animals that have the same molecular signature, we can call it, fingerprint, yeah? very specific, like our brain neurons. And this is then getting interesting, because then we can look into these organs and learn something about ourselves, and especially about the brain structures that existed in the last common ancestor of us and this, and, and this worm. Um, these are the stages we are looking at. Um, this is our tool, so um, these worms are meanwhile extremely well investigated. This stage here has something like 12,000 cells, and this is good for us. It's relatively few because we can sequence them all and then and, and learn about each cell. Yeah, you see the cells marked 
with, with different colors here. So these are the individual cells of the worm. And these here, these colors, on the other hand, demarcate genes that are expressed in the body. Yeah? I won't go into too much detail here. For you, it's enough to know that for the entire worm, we know the cells, we know what they look like. So you see this is an electron optic yeah, image. And at the same time, we know the genes that are expressed in the body. And this is, for us, very valuable. So we have an entire animal. Everything is known in terms of gene expression in the body. So we can now interrogate what do these cells look like and what genes do they express. And so we can go into these cells of the mushroom body, for example. And this is what we did. Um, this is we, a reconstruction of the worm's brain. We look at the front end. Yeah, you roughly recognize this is such a worm. We are looking at this box here. And this is then dissecting the um, electron optic information. We, can, we have labeled the different neurons. Every neuron is a, is a ball here. And the axons are the lines. And you see that uh, in, and these are the mushroom bodies, actually, of, of the worm. And you see that it has different blue blue colored um, neurons here that are part of the mushroom bodies. And you see they project directly into this, what is labeled with NSP. And um, so these are the mushroom body neurons. The red cells, they, the axons go everywhere. This is what, what I've written here. And the blue cells project into the neurosecretory plexus, a release site for the hormones. And this is um, just like the hypothalamic neurons in the beginning. You remember, we have this strange brain part, which has neurons that project um, into the release site where hormones are released that go into the blood. Very similar here, we have um, neurons that are sitting here and that project into a part of the brain where hormones are released, this I can tell you. And this looks very similar. So this is obviously a very ancient component of the brain. And um, if we look at the same neurons again, but from another angle, we see again the blue balls here. This, these represent part of the mushroom body neurons. And what you also see are these little extensions that they have to the top. So they are sending a little protrusion to the, to the outside almost. And this is the last data I want to show you. Yeah, we again see the same peduncles of the mushroom body. And these blue cells have these endings, we call them, long sensory endings. These are cellular protrusions that they use for sensing something from the outside. And all I want to tell you here is that these blue cells, they not only project their axons to the release site, but they also have sensory endings to conceive information, to perceive information. And so they get information about the environment. And this is, in a way, this is it already. So this is the simple construction of mushroom bodies in our warm. Yeah, these are so-called sensory secretory neurons, just like our hypothesized ancestral neurons right, that, I, that I just showed you a few minutes ago. So think about cells that sense the environment and then um, integrate the information and then send out an axon to release something. And um, so what can we learn from this, these findings about the evolution of the nervous system? And here I come to my last part, a blueprint of our brain. So what you saw in the sponge and what you also saw in the worm's brain and what is also existing in our brain are these cells that can sense the environment. They have sensory, so-called sensory endings. They receive information about the environment here. They are called, uh, we call them here olfactory receptors um, because they, they sense chemicals from the environment. And then they um, integrate this information they project their secretory release sites, and either this goes directly into the blood or it goes to other neurons that would then, for example, act as a motor center. So this would be motor neurons that, that execute certain movements. This is when we move, when we have taken a decision, then we move. So, but this is, just imagine that now we have, um, we can control different behaviors. We have, for example, a, a sort of neuron this is called, it has the olfactory receptor 1. It perceives, for example, smells another attractive worm. And, and then it releases something like oxytocin. 
And then there's a specific sort of motor neuron that then maybe executes sex behavior. Yeah? And that's a simple decision to take. Smell, smell the attractive worm, release oxytocin, and then um, continue here. There can be, and this motor neuron stands now for an, an entire behavior. If we have um, feeding, it might be another neuron involved. This one here would smell gorgeous food. Yeah? So this neuron here could be the one that notices, okay, there's something very attractive, very yummy in the environment. And it could then, for example, release dopamine and initiate feeding. So this could be the motor center that initiates feeding behavior. This is a very simple brain, right? And there could be uh, uh, yet another neuron that has receptors for much bigger worms or predators. And this would be the one then that releases stress hormones and maybe initiates a flight response. Yeah, so just run away or, or, or cr crawl away. And so this, this here would be three different behaviors that are encoded by different neurons and um, initiate different behaviors. So what happens now if there is conflicting information? Sorry. So everybody is, all the, if there are conflicting signals, like there is both a, an attractive worm and also a much bigger worm that is, a, that is a threat. So what do you do then? And then you have to decide. And this, if you think about it, this is what also our brain is about. We have conflicting information. Sometimes it's not conflicting. Sometimes every, everything is clear. But sometimes there's information about in this direction or information in that direction, and you have to take decisions. Yeah, the, this, these decisions can be easy or they can be more complicated. And what you need then is that these cells talk to each other. And this is drawn here. So if this is here a slightly stronger impulse, if this signal is slightly stronger, um, what happens now is that these cells inhibit, inhibit each other. So they, they tell, they not only activate their behavior, they also tell the other neurons, you better shut up. This, they inhibit them, this is how we call it. And then, in a way, the brain is already functional. Then you have um, the possibility with this inhib inhibitory synapses um, to take decisions. If, if the attractive worm is the most, the most important signal, yeah, it is able to inhibit the others, and, and the worm will engage in sex behavior, or the, or the other way around. If, if it is too stressful, everything else is repressed. And this is, in a way, also similar to, to your brain. You take these decisions, different decisions. Your, your life is much more complex, yeah? but in a way, it is similar. And what I, what I try to draw here is how we could figure such an, uh, an easy, simple brain as, and this could be close to the evolutionary precursors, what was first in place. Yeah? Starting, we know from our data that it must have been very simple sensory um, neurons that were also able to release signals, and they talk to each other, and then you can imagine what a simple brain looked like. And our hypothesis is that what is today's cortex would resemble this, so the, our, your, the big part of your brain that I showed at the beginning that is computer-like, and the Hypothalamus, the other part, could be similar to this part of the brain. Yeah? And I won't go into any more detail. I would just say this is how we try to imagine and to, to reconstruct the first phases of, of brain evolution. Yeah? I like this. This is the ocean in us, in that um, everything that you are comes from the ocean, comes from the sea. And if we want to understand our origins, we have to do marine biology and, and look into these marine sponges, worms, and so on. And um, the last picture I'm showing is this. All of this is, of course, done by, by um, young people who are just a little older than you. Yeah, they have taken the decision to become scientists. They are part of our labs. At, in, in this case, they are all at EMBL, in, up, up the hill in the International Research Laboratory that, that you find there. And um, some of them are still there. Some of them have left. This is a, a, a group picture from 22. And, um, but it's very nice, we went to a, uh, a nice place to discuss science, and that, this should maybe inspire you. This could also be you, also you could decide to, to follow some interesting questions of your taste, yeah, and engage in science, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>